Lose an Ante. I'm the lead pastor here at Victory Church in Sharon. I want to thank you for watching our sermon video today. And I want to encourage you that if you live in the area and you don't have a home church of your own, please come and be our guest some Sunday. You can get all of our information online at www.victory-ag.com. We'll see you soon. Thinking back, you know, um, we're starting this new teaching series today, and, and uh, in that teaching series, it's based on a book that we are, I'm, I'm hoping that you will work through with us, okay? So, uh, unfortunately, the English versions are sold out, and we have more coming, so they'll be here probably tomorrow or the day after, but there's no English versions, but we do have the Portuguese version of the book and it's out there on the, uh, on the table. Sabrina will be out there after the service and, and you can purchase uh, uh, a copy from her. Next week we will definitely have the final product uh, English version. And if you want to, you can go on Amazon.com and you can actually download the uh, Kindle, if you use Kindle, if you read through a Kindle. And that's $10 there. These are $5 out here, so a little cheaper if you wait. But. Um, in the book, I tell a story about my first job. My very first job was working at McDonald's. Actually, I shouldn't say it wasn't my first job. My first job was working for my father at the age of about 11, 10, 11 years old, carrying wood. We used to cut wood. We heated our entire house all winter long via wood stoves. And so we would cut wood all, all summer long and uh, we would have um, between four and five cords of wood. I don't know if you know what that is, but that's gigantic blocks of wood that we would cut up all summer long. Four to, four to five of them would heat the house throughout the entire winter. And so I would haul these, these logs, basically. He would cut the wood and I would haul it up this hill uh, out, of our, out of our property up to the, the van. And, and then I would have to help him split it all and stuff. A dollar an hour. That was what I got paid at like 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old. I couldn't wait to get to be 16 because at 16 I could get a, a real job, you know? Because, you know, you want to get the real job. You don't want to be working for your dad. The thing about working for your dad is you didn't have an option. You couldn't call in sick, you know? You, could, you couldn't say, Dad, I don't feel like working today. I'm going to take a sick day, you know? He put sick day right here, you know? And so I had to work. It was, you just had to do it. And so I, when I got 16 years old, I got my job, my real job at McDonald's. Back then it was like $4.45 an hour or something like that, Four forty-two an hour is what, what minimum wage was. And so I was making that and, and I was a grill man. They put me, they said, you're gonna be our grill man. I said, okay. And so they took me in the back and some guy started teaching me what I was supposed to do, but I didn't, I, I, you know, there was so many different parts and so many things that you had to do that I couldn't remember everything. And then they were like, basically they're like, okay, good luck. You know, I love there's, there's on, on uh, one of the radio stations I listen to at times, the weather the, or the traffic girl, she gives the traffic and she says, you know, uh, 128 is backed up from, you know, all the way up in the North Shore, all the way down, and so it's backed up there. 24 North is all backed up here. 95 North from Providence all the way up here, it's all backed up. And then her last thing, she says, good luck. That's what she says, good luck. And that's the traffic, good luck. Well, that's what I felt like. They were like, here's what you do. You gotta put 10, 10 hamburger patties on the grill at one time and then do two more for, for uh, Big Mac. And then, so they, t they called it 10 and two, and then you had to do 10 and two, and then I had to put the, the, the fries into the fryer. You dump the fries in the fryer and get that thing, and you press the button, and the button would be a timer. And then you come back to the hamburgers that you already set the timer for, and the beeper starts going off. So you gotta flip all the 10, 12, to, you know, 14 hamburgers, and then somebody orders a, a chicken, Sandwich, and so you got to take the chicken, fried chicken. It's like a, it's like you know, like the sole of a shoe, frozen, 
and you got to put it into the fryer, you know, and then I'm coming back to the hamburgers, and then all of a sudden the, the French fry thing is beeping over here, and so I got to go pull those out. Oh, you forgot to salt them. You got to salt them and throw them into the thing. And, and so I had all these things that I was responsible for. Then when the hamburgers come off, the buzzer starts going again, and, and you got to put them on, a, on the buns, and the buns, you just ran them through this big machine that kind of toasts them, and, and you gotta, then you got to squirt the, the, all the, you know, uh, what do you call it, the ketchup and mustard and everything and all. And I remember, I, I just couldn't do this job. I was not capable. I, 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 it's McDonald's. <laughs> but I wasn't capable. And I remember, I remember being back there, and I would panic when I was on the schedule to go to work. I was like, oh, my God, i got to go to work. I don't want to go to work. I don't want to go to work. And I'd go in, and I'd work, and I'd, I'd feel like I was a mess, like I was messing everything up, you know? I mean, when I was done, the, the, the lettuce, there was more lettuce on the floor than there was on sandwiches. One night, I woke up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat. I had a nightmare. It was a nightmare. And I dreamed that I was all by myself in McDonald's in the back. And I only had two hands and I'm trying to flip burgers and I'm trying to get things out of this grill and that grill. And all the buzzers and the beepers and everything were going off all at the same time. Beep, 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 meh, 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 beep, beep, beep. And, I, and I'm trying to run. And I literally woke up and I literally sat up in bed almost like crying because I was like panicked. And I said, I'm quitting that job, man. <laughs> I went into McDonald's the next day to collect my check, you know? And I told the, the manager, the store manager was there, and the shift manager, that was my shift manager, they were both there. And I said, listen, I'm going to get my check, and I'm not coming in anymore. They're like, what do you mean? I said, I quit. I don't want to work here no more. And they're like, what do you mean? I said, I, I just, I don't want to do it. And at that point, I, I actually, what I told, I think what I told her was, I can't, I can't do this job. That's what I said. And at that point, the store manager looked at the shift manager, and this is what she said. She started talking to her like I wasn't even there anymore. She goes, do you know why, you know why he's quitting? I'm thinking, yeah, I know why I'm quitting, you know. I'm waking up with cold sweats in the middle of the night. That's why I'm quitting. She goes, you know why he's quitting? She goes, why? I, and, and this is what she said. She goes, because because of poor training. We didn't train him right. We're losing this young man because we didn't train him right. I'll never forget those words. What, what an unbelievable thought. She says, I, we're, we're, we didn't train him correctly, and so we're losing him. It wasn't my fault that I couldn't do the job. That's what she was saying. It's not his fault. I didn't know what was expected of me as a grill man. I didn't even know what a capable grill man looked like. See, no one took the initiative to take me under their wing and to mentor me in that position. Instead, I was given just enough information to do the work, and I was thrown at the mercies of the hamburgers and the fries, French fries. I think we have a similar problem in the body of Christ. Most people in today's church think that they're disciples of Jesus just because they attend once or twice a month or because, you know, they hold these beliefs. But see, being a disciple is more than just attending an occasional service. It's, you're not just a disciple because you've been baptized or because you take communion. If you ask most people in the church today, what is a disciple of Jesus? The most common answer that you would get is a disciple is a follower of Jesus. Okay, yeah, that's good. But what does that mean? What does that really mean? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? John Stott, great theologian, this is what he wrote. He said, the Christian landscape is strewn with the wreckage of derelict, half-built towers. The ruins of those who began to build and were unable to finish. For thousands of people still ignore Christ's warning and undertake to follow him 
without first pausing to reflect on the cost of doing so. The result is the great scandal of Christendom today, so-called nominal Christianity. In countries to which Christian civilization, civilization has spread, large numbers of people have covered themselves with a decent but thin veneer of Christianity. They've allowed themselves to become somewhat involved, enough to be respectable, but not enough to be uncomfortable. Their religion is a great soft cushion. It protects them from the hard unpleasantness of life while changing its place and shape to suit their own convenience. No wonder cynics speak of hypocrites in the church and dis dismiss religion as escapism. John Stott. I kind of think that we need to start our walks with Christ with the final, the final product, the end result in mind. We need to ask ourselves, what do we want to produce in our discipleship efforts? As a church, what do we want the disciples who come out of, out of Victory Church, what do we want these disciples to look like? The best question is, what does a true disciple of Jesus look like? So this morning we're starting this new teaching series entitled The Final Product. Because that's what we want. We want products that comes out of our systems that reflect who Christ is, the final product. This teaching series is going to look at discipleship. But I want you to understand something that I don't want to just, I don't want to just give you information in this series. My goal in presenting this teaching series over the next four weeks, okay, my goal is to raise up an army of people who want to disciple others in how to live for Christ. I want to start a discipleship movement here on the South Shore. This is not just another teaching series. In fact, at the end of this series, I'm going to challenge you to sign up to be one of our discipleship mentors. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be coming to you. I'm, and if you don't sign up yourself and I see that you have great uh, potential to be a great discipleship mentor, I'm coming to you with my list. I want, us to, to, I want you to sign up to be a mentor, to disciple somebody else. The definition of a disciple that we currently use here at Victory Church is this. A disciple is a radically transformed, fully developing follower of Jesus. You'll find that in Excel number one, the first Excel class. Let me kind of break that down for you. Radically transformed. Radically transformed, really, it equals life change. It, it, it talks about the change that takes place in our life. When somebody surrenders their cri to Christ, think about the difference that should take place. Uh, listen, I want you to understand something. C.H. Spurgeon, he said there's no such thing as a tearless salvation. I remember reading that, I was like, wow, that's powerful. But I want you to know, when I gave my life to Christ, the change was so radical, the love that I felt was so powerful, the, the, the freedom from guilt and from fear and from, from junk, it was so transforming that I bawled like a baby. The Bible teaches us that the old things are passed away and everything becomes new, 2 Corinthians 5.17. When I gave to my life to Christ, everything changed. My outlook on life, my decision making, my relationships, my purpose, they were all transformed. I was so different that the people who were closest to me, the people who were closest to me, they saw that there was something that was actually different about me. They could see it. Jesus had transformed my life radically. Radically transformed talks about life change. Fully developing. That talks about growth. It speaks about growth. It's our desire. It's my desire. It's, it's the leadership desire of our church that every person who attends our church is growing in every area of their lives. I don't want to just see you growing in Bible knowledge. We do connect groups, yes, yeah, so that we can give Bible knowledge, but I also give connect groups so that we can learn how to handle our finances 
how to be a better husband, how to be a better parent. You know, these are the kind of things that we want to do because we want to be growing in every area of our lives, not just spiritually, but, but the spiritual aspect of your growth should bleed out into your work area. So your professional life should be growing. So your financial life should be growing. So you'll become a better parent and a better spouse. I want to see people growing in their professional life, becoming better skilled workers and leaders. Growth should be constant in all the areas of our lives. In fact, if a person is seeking first God's kingdom, they will experience growth in other areas of their life as well. Luke chapter 12, verse 31. The third part of that says, a radically transformed, fully developing follower of Jesus. Follower of Jesus actually speaks of our allegiance. This speaks to the fact that my allegiance has changed. You see, before I, before I knew Christ, I followed my own ways. I did things that I wanted to do. I made decisions on what I thought was best for me. All of my life was self-centered. Before you came to Christ, all of your life was self-centered. I, I guarantee it. But when I came to Christ, my life became Christ-centered. Now I want to do the things that please him. I want to make decisions based on what he thinks is best for me. I put his kingdom first in my life, and I work hard to live the way that Jesus lived. Our allegiance has changed. So let me ask that question one more time. What does a true disciple look like? What are the characteristics that are present in a radically transformed, fully developing follower of Jesus? How can I know that somebody is actually a disciple of Jesus? You know, I'm a, I'm a very graphic-oriented individual. I like seeing the graphics. I love seeing colors and, and stuff. It helps me to learn. My, uh, several of my sons are, are just like that. They, you know, Andrew especially. Andrew, Andrew watches everything. He learns from seeing. That's the way I learn. I learn from seeing. I learn from, from visual. And you know, doing that, I think a lot of us are like that. In fact, I think that a lot more in the kingdom of God, a lot more is caught than is actually taught. And in my life, when I gave my life to Christ, I needed a physical example of what it meant to be a Christian. I needed a pattern to base my life on. I needed someone to be able to watch so that I could look at them and I could catch the way that they serve God. I could see and I could see how they interacted with their family and how they interacted with their, their kids and, and how they did the church. That was my pastor for me. My pastor, his name was Stephen Giles. Great man of God. I love him to this day. I watched how he interacted with his wife. I watched how he parented his kids. I watched how he ministered to our church people, and I watched him at play. I watched him how he handled anger. I remember, I remember one night watching him at play. I remember one night our, our Royal Rangers, back then we had Royal Rangers. That was like a little boys, almost like Boy Scouts. And the Royal Rangers went on a camp out. But in our church was so small that when Royal Rangers went on a camp out, all the, any of the guys, all the boys went, you know, all the teenagers and everybody, we all went together. We'd go do it together. And I remember I was working that night. I was, it was, I was about 19. I had a van, and I was working uh, at the job that I had at that point. And I wanted to go and go camping with them out in the, the back of these woods. So I, I found, I knew where they were going to be or, or about where they were going to be. So I got on this dirt road, and I started driving in. And I turned off my music, and I opened all the windows so I could listen for them. And I started hearing some noise in this woods, and I just started driving towards the noise. I'm like, what in the world is that? What is, that's got to be them. You know, it's got to be the boys. So I started driving to it, and then I see through, like, the trees and stuff, I see the fire, uh, the, like, the campfire coming up. And I was like, oh, that's got to be them. But I didn't know how to get into the camp. So I stopped the van, got out of the van, and I started pushing my way through the bushes, you know. And I get through and into the camp itself. And there is my pastor, okay? 
all of the Royal Rangers, they have him, apparently what happened was this. He snuck up in the, in the dark of night, you know, and the kids were all there doing the camp out, and they're doing their activities, and he snuck up with a whole crate of eggs. And he started throwing eggs into the camp, throwing them at the kids, at the Royal Rangers, and at the teenagers, and at the youth leaders, as he's hiding in the woods. He's, he's bombarding them with... Finally, they realize somebody's out here throwing eggs at us, so they start chasing him. It was our pastor. And they grabbed him, and they captured him, and they tied him to a stake, okay? And all the little boys had a fire built around him. They were getting ready to light him on fire, and they were all dancing around him like Indians. Hey, 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 and they're dancing around him, going to burn him at the stake. And I walked through just as he's there, and his little son, who went up there with him, was throwing eggs with him. His little son, Benny, at the time, was maybe eight years old, goes, let my daddy go, and he's crying. That was my pastor at play. Now, you know, and some people look at me and go, Pastor Lou, what's wrong with you? Look, it's, I followed the leader, man, you know? I had an example. That was my example. So if, if I'm messed up, you know where I got it from. I watched him at play. I watched him interact with his family. I watched the way he... He interacted with the church. I learned how to pattern my life, how to become a Jesus follower. I learned by watching him. I remember people telling me, you know, don't put your eyes on man. Don't look at a man. Keep your eyes on Jesus because man is going to fail you. Listen, I understood what they were saying, but can I tell you something? That is not biblical. It's not a biblical concept. Paul the Apostle said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 1, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. In other words, if you want to know what it is to live for God, you watch me. Watch the things that I do. Watch the things that I say and follow my pattern that I lay out. People will fail you, that's an excuse for easy Christianity. Every new believer needs someone that they can look at as an example of how to pattern their walk for God. In order to be those healthy examples of disciples, we need to truly understand what a disciple is. There's many verses to disciples, about disciples and discipleship. A lot of things that Jesus said in the New Testament. In fact, Matthew chapter 10, verse 39, Jesus said, if someone loses his life for my sake, then he will actually find life. Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 24, Jesus said, if you follow him, you will be expected to take up your cross daily. Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 58, informs us that even the animals of the field have, have nests, but if you follow Christ, you may not have a place to lay your head. Luke chapter 9, verse 62, Jesus says, once you start following him, you're not to turn around and look back or you'll be unfit for the kingdom of God. There's a lot of things that are, that are there that he said about discipleship. There's a lot of things that are in the scriptures about discipleship. But even though he spoke a lot about discipleship, there's only three times in the New Testament where Jesus defines a disciple. He says, you, if you do this, you are one of my disciples. This is, this is a definition of discipleship. And I want to give you these three characteristics this morning. And what we're going to do is as we go through these three characteristics, I'm not going to explain them too much, but, but we're going to look at them real quick. And then next week, we're going to handle the first, the first characteristic. The week after that, we're going to look at the second characteristic. The week after that, we're going to look at the third characteristic of a disciple. And then the fifth week, we'll close everything up. These three characteristics of a disciple are the basis of our discipleship efforts here at Victory Church. I believe that this is what a disciple looks like, a true disciple of Jesus. These characteristics define the final product of discipleship. And each time that John records one of these, all, all three of these characteristics come out of the Gospel of John. And each time that he records one of these characteristics of a disciple, he gives us an illustration. 
You understand, I hope you understand that when the gospel writers wrote, they wrote with a purpose in mind. So a lot of times the stories that they put, they put in different places, not in a chronological order necessarily, but they put them in a, in, in a certain pattern so that they would make their points to the audience that they were writing to. And the, in the Gospel of John, I think one of the things, one of the themes that is overlooked is that theme of discipleship. And Jesus, in John chapter, uh, John, in, uh, three times in the Gospel of John, he gives us a characteristic of what a disciple is. And right before he gives that characteristic, there is an illustration, a story, or some kind of parable that is laid out for us that illustrates that, that, that characteristic. And so let me give you these three characteristics that Jesus uses to define a disciple. The first characteristic of a disciple is found in John chapter 8, verse 31. John 8, verse 31. It says this. So Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, he says this. If you abide in my word. Is that what it says up here? If you hold to my teaching in the NIV. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. If you abide in my word, Jesus said it, abide in my word. Next week, we'll look at this characteristic and study what that means for us. And hopefully those books will be in so you can go ahead and purchase one. You can be reading with us as we go. The second characteristic of a disciple is found in John chapter 13, verse 35, where Jesus tells his disciples at the Last Supper, he says this, by, all this, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples in that you love one another. If you love one another, then you are my disciples. That's the second characteristic. first characteristic of a disciple is that we abide in his word. What does that mean? We'll talk about it next week. Second characteristic of a disciple is that if you are a disciple, you love other disciples. You love other disciples. We'll talk about what that means. The third characteristic of a disciple is found in John chapter 15, verse 8. And he gives us this third characteristic, and he says this, he says, By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. He didn't just say this is an evidence of discipleship. He said this is the total proof, is that you bear much fruit. This is Jesus' own definition of a disciple. A disciple is someone who lives according to God's word. A disciple is someone who, who loves other disciples. A disciple is someone who bears much fruit. Over the next four weeks, we'll unpack each of these characteristics to see what they mean, and we'll see how they apply to our lives. It's my prayer that as we study together, not only will you grow in your understanding of what a disciple is, but that your desire to truly represent Christ properly as his disciple, will grow also. I want to raise up a discipleship army, folks. I want to raise up a church that is on a mission. And that mission is to, to represent Christ correctly and to invest their lives in new believers who will in turn turn around and invest their lives in others. The last thing that Jesus told us before going back into heaven, after he rose from the dead, he was with his disciples. And the very last thing he says to his disciples before he goes into heaven is found in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. And he, we call it the Great Commission. He said, go into all nations and make disciples. Listen, that commission was not just for his apostles. Okay, It wasn't just for pastors. It wasn't just for teachers. It was for every believer, every follower of Jesus, go and disciple the nations. That's what he said. We'll talk about what that means as well. Folks, that is God's agenda for every single one of us. Let me say it one more time. To be a discipler of others, that's God's agenda for every one of us. When I was growing up, there was a song that came out. It was called Plastic Jesus. The lyrics went like this. And it, I try and sing it a little bit for you. Some of you may even remember it. It says, I don't care if it rains or freezes, as 
As long as I got my plastic Jesus riding on the dashboard of my car, comes in colors pink and pleasant, glows in the dark because he's in iridescent, I take him with me when I travel far. I can let my curses all roll. Plastic Jesus doesn't hear because he's only got a plastic ear. The man who invented plastic saved my soul. I want you to see this video. Hey, I'm Ryan. I'm a Christian, and this is my story. Growing up, I never was going to church. And when I was 12, I accepted Christ as my Savior. I, I was even baptized. It, it undoubtedly was a very important decision. It even affected how I lived in high school. I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I had fun on the weekends. I had a girlfriend, a couple, but I was a normal high school kid. College was one big blur, but I did make it to church out of obedience. And after school, I married a great girl, and she's been a great influence on me. Life's been good. I have a house, three kids. I couldn't ask for more. I mean, sure, I worry about my future. I mean, my marriage, it could be better. And I need to spend more time with my kids, but, but things will be all right. I have my faith. You may not hear me talk about it a lot, but it's just because it's personal. But don't worry for me. My Jesus is real. My heart breaks for many people who attend church. Because many people are not experiencing the abundant life that God wants them to have. Instead of a lifelong journey with the risen Christ, they've settled for a short drive with a plastic Jesus. Listen, the only thing that is needed to experience all that God has for you or for me is for us to get on the same page with him. For us to stop trying to get him to get on our page. For us to get on his agenda instead of trying to get him on our agenda. To stop trying to squeeze him into our life when we think it fits in our schedule. His agenda disciple the nations. That's what we're supposed to be about. Let's stand. Thank you for taking the time to watch this teaching video today. If this video has impacted you, we would love to know what God is doing in your life. You can get a hold of us by going online at www.victory-ag.com and you'll notice a link there right on the home page that says I need prayer. You can click that link and it'll take you to a little prayer page and you fill out the information and whether it's a, a prayer request that you have or whether it's a praise report of something that God has done and maybe something he spoke to you from this sermon, please send that to us and we'll be praying for you. And again, if you uh, live in the area, we want to encourage you to come and be our guest at Victory Church in Sharon. God bless you.